Um, well, I, I, I come with some apprehension to talk to you about this, but I'm rather moved by the thought of coming to an institution called Design London, because when I was uh, rather flatteringly granted a doctorate at the Royal College, I made an address in which I said that I would be quite interested in talking to students uh, about the relationship between this much uh, vaunted intelligent design, which has become a subject of such uh, extraordinary interest amongst these ardent Christians in the middle of the United States, and what I think is much more preferable, which is what I call intelligible design. In other words, the, <clears throat> the understanding of the structure and function of living things, for, uh, for which I do not, and never have, long before I became a biologist, ever felt tempted to invoke the notion of an intelligent designer who is responsible for the varieties of living things. Like many people, I am extremely puzzled and rather moved by the varieties of living organisms, but uh, long before I ever studied biology um, and then went to Cambridge to do the natural sciences, I don't think I was ever tempted to think that what I saw uh, under the microscope, or when I went to the zoo, or when I studied uh, invertebrate zoology and vertebrate zoology, and indeed botany, I never felt tempted by the idea that this was the product of an intelligent designer. There is a sense, of course, in which people are struck, quite understandably, by the fact that the living things do seem to epitomize what one would call design, in that they have a formal structure, and that the structure actually underwrites and is responsible for their efficiency. And what one American philosopher, Dennett, Daniel Dennett, has called the thing which distinguishes living things from inanimate things, and that is that they have what is peculiar to living organisms, they have interests. Now, by that he doesn't mean that they are interested in things, but there are, they have interests in their future. They have interested interests in perpetuating themselves. They also have interests in reproducing themselves. And this is absolutely peculiar to living organisms. And it is that which makes them uh, the exponents of what we call actions on the one hand, as opposed to the things which we see with inanimate things, which are merely mechanical events, which are the expression of the relationship between cause and effect. There is obviously something peculiar about living things in that they have what we would call actions. Something, although the word action is sometimes applied to things like the action of the heart, the action of acids on metals, the action of wind on water and so forth, when we use the word action, what we are talking about is something which is in fact peculiar to living organisms, and that is that they act on behalf of their continued interests. Whereas, um, when a billiard ball is struck by another billiard ball, the fact that it moves, it doesn't move in order to escape and preserve its integrity. Um, it is simply the result of the impact. There is physical cause and effect. When a piece of ice melts in water, we know that it is mathematically related to the temperature of the water that it is not in any sense trying to preserve its shape and is, it were, um, rather disconcerted by the fact that it seems to be vanishing in the water as the water gets hotter. Whereas, in fact, a living organism is, in fact, doing something on its own behalf. The, uh, this tendency was, is epitomized by a poem which I really wish I'd brought to read to you, although I don't want to bore you by going to the lengths of reading a poem. I was struck some years ago by a poem that was written by Robert Frost called A Considerable Speck. Frost was sitting in his yard writing outside in the sunlight and was struck by a speck of what he thought was dust moving by what he thought was his breath blown. And then he became aware of the fact that this speck had something distinctive about its movements, which led him to think that it was not merely blown by his breath, but was in some way motivated, as opposed to its movements being caused. It walked, although its legs, as Frost points out, were invisible. It moved in the direction of the ink of his script, which was not yet dry. 
recoiled from it, went in the opposite direction, it crouched down, and it exhibited what he thought was a quite clear tendency of not wishing to die. Now, the extent to which I think perhaps Frost exaggerates the conscious wish of not wishing to die is perhaps, as I say, an exaggeration. But there is something, and there was something peculiar about this previously negligible speck, a speck which had it been, as he thought, as he suspected to begin with, an inanimate object, the very fact that it quite clearly had self-interests in not dying, whether or not it consciously entertained that interest in not dying, it acted in such a way that it actually tended, as it were, to preserve its continued existence, and that from being a negligible speck, in the light of what he then observed, it became a considerable speck, something which was worthy of consideration because he recognized that in some way, albeit low down on the tree of life, that it was, in fact, not unlike himself, who also did not wish to die and also took actions on his own behalf. So that when I began to study biology, I became, um, long before I read Frost, I was struck, though I had not yet read Dennett's books on the subject, I was struck by these, this curious capacity of living things to exhibit self-interest. But they also exhibited something which was very striking to me when I did become a biologist, and when I was at school at St. Paul's with a very brilliant biology master who uh, taught my contemporary Oliver Sacks at the same time as I was doing it, um, I became struck by the fact that there was, um, quite evidently, design. There were plans, at least. There were structures, and that the structures tended to repeat themselves from one generation to the next. And I also, like anyone who is an observant biologist, became aware of the fact that there were, in fact, a series of recognizable distinctions in these designs and that they were very striking, that they fell into large classes which, it, notwithstanding the enormous variety um, and diversity within each class, they fell into these distinct classes of what we call phyla. Now, we now know, as a result of the work of people uh, like Stephen Jay Gould, for example, who in his study of the Burgess Shale in Canada, that the establishment of the basic designs, what the Germans called Bauplans, began to appear and was established, the basic designs were established um, about 500 million years ago in a very explosive eruption of creativity um, on the part of nature. Not on the part of a designer, but on the part of nature, spontaneously erupting into a series of designs which have preserved themselves with some losses from the period of the Cambrian in that early explosion.